So Hare Krishna everyone to our class on the Nectar of Devotion, which is a summary study book written by ISKCON's founder Acharya A.C. Bhaktivedant Shila Prabhupada. We have already started this uh, study by already having one class on 30th of May 2022. Because of some gap, uh, because of my illness and some business trips, we have to now proceed for the second class today after a gap of maybe roughly four weeks. So this is our second class. And today we will discuss the introduction of the book Nectar of Devotion. Before we start our discussion, I would like to request for a volunteer who can recite Mangalacharan prayers. Anyone from the devotee group can I will do I will do Prabhu. Okay, Manish Prabhuji, please continue. Thank you. O Magyana Timirandasya Gyanan Jana Shalakaya Chukshurum Militam Yena Tasme Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitan Nemano Bhistam Shapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupam Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Di Guruna Vaishnavam Cham Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahita Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Shu He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanto Namastute Tripta Kantana Gaurangi Shri Radhe Vrundavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Trubhesha Krupa Sindhuba Evacha Titanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namona Maha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara, Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vranda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, Manish Prabhuji, thank you very much. Okay, so let us do the recap of the class that we had last time. So this is summary of class one, which was based on the preface of the book Nectar of Devotion. So we mentioned about the background about the book. And uh, Nectar of Devotion is a summary study of original book by Shila Prabhupada, Shila Rup Goswami, uh, titled as Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu. So Shila Rup Goswami was the original author and he wrote this book called Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu. And the book Nectar of Devotion actually is the summary study by A.C. Bhaktivedan Shila Prabhupada on this original book by Shila Rup Goswami. We also discussed that this is a very, very important book among Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Gaudiya Vaishnavas are those Vaishnavas who are uh, a follower of Vaishnavism, which originated in Bengal, known as Gaudadesh. And they are primarily followers of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the speciality about this uh, uh, bhakti that the Gaudiya Vaishnavas are following is Madhurya Bhakti. So this book, Nectar of Devotion, actually talks in detail about Madhurya Bhakti. And we briefly mentioned to you that Bhakti can be done in various moods like Shant Ras, then Dasya Ras, or uh, Sakya Ras, or Vatsalya Ras. But this is the book which specifically talks about Madhurya Bhakti. Uh, bhakti in the mood of sweetness or conjugal relationship with Lord Sri Krishna. Uh, uh, in, in short or in simple words, bhakti that was performed by the gopis uh, towards Lord Krishna in that mood. So this book tells about that kind of bhakti. We then briefly discussed about what is the purpose of uh, the preface of any book. And uh, 
main mainly we talk about two things when we are talking about a preface that what is the book all about so the subject matter of the book and why the book is written so that is mainly the preface and in that same light we understood uh, the various topics that have been discussed by shila prabhupad in the preface of nectar of devotion and one of the topic uh, he is discussing in his preface in the beginning of the preface is the history of shila rup goswami so shila rup, rup goswami is the author of uh, bhakti rasamrit sindhu and in nectar of devotion shila prabhupad briefly talks about who is shila rup goswami and he introduces rup goswami as one of the ministers in the mohammedan government at that point of time in in bengal and uh, he was a very scholarly person he was a very gifted skillful uh, talented person shila rup goswami and identifying rup goswami from this hindu community the uh, king of the mohammedan government appointed rup goswami as a minister in his government mainly because uh, if he would appoint rup goswami as the minister then there will be not much difficulty in ruling the uh ruling the people in bengal so that's why he appointed him as the minister so rup goswami ultimately left this mohammedan government because he wanted to uh, pursue his life as a devotee of lord sri chaitanya mahaprabhu and he left this mohammedan government and joined chaitanya mahaprabhu and ultimately received multiple instructions from chaitanya mahaprabhu so the main instructions that he received from chaitanya mahaprabhu was about uh, uncovering those places in vrindavan where lord radha and krishna had performed their past times that is the leelas of radha and krishna so there were many places so chaitanya mahaprabhu gave instruction to rup goswami to uncover those places to find them and and establish them as their uh, leela sthalis then construct various temples of shri radha and krishna and then explore the whole vedic literature vedic literature is very vast very wide explore vedic literature and write books to establish bhakti or devotional service towards radha, radha and krishna as the main objective of all these vedic literature so he was supposed to write books and not only write books but also teach what he is writing in those books uh, and establish bhakti and also exemplify bhakti through their own life so uh, these were the instruction that chaitanya mahaprabhu gave to rup goswami and not only to rup goswami but also to the other five goswamis uh, uh, like sanatan goswami uh, raghunath das goswami raghunath bhat goswami gopal bhat goswami and the sixth goswami was jeev goswami so to all the six goswamis chaitanya mahaprabhu gave these instructions <clears throat> then uh, we understood what is bhakti ras amrat sindhu so bhakti means devotional service rasa is the word that comes in the title of this book called bhakti ras amrat sindhu so rasa is was another topic that we discussed in our class in, in for, on preface so rasa we understood is the pleasure that we drive when we do any activity so for example if a person is uh, uh, doing any activity the whole purpose of doing that activity is to derive some pleasure we go to watch a cinema we go to play some cricket or we go to play some sports we do we go to our office for doing some work we engage in a relationship uh, as a husband and wife as a father and a son etc etc so we do multiple activities in our life but the ultimate objective of all these activities is to derive some pleasure from these activities when we discussed about what is the difference between ordinary rasa and the bhakti rasa because we are our topic is bhakti ras amrit sindhu so uh, in the word that comes in this topic is rasa uh, so we need to differentiate between what is the difference between bhakti rasa and ordinary rasa we understood that these two rasas are different and what is the difference between these two rasas 
ordinary rasa is oscillatory and temporary oscillatory means bhog and tyag bhog and tyag means we when we engage in ordinary rasa we derive some pleasure but after some time we start to feel bored from uh, from that rasa from that taste and that's why we want to go away from that rasa and we gave the example of a person going to office for work but after going for 5 days or maybe 6 months or 7 months the person wants to now go away from that work he wants to go and take a break uh, go to some place to just enjoy and just relax so that is what means oscillatory means bhog and tyag so ordinary rasa is oscillatory and then temporary temporary means uh, it doesn't last forever it doesn't last forever so we enjoy in that ordinary rasa and then ultimately we find that it, this rasa or this taste is diminishing is is going away from uh, from from our life so that means temporary similarly uh, we also discussed about bhakti rasa and understood how bhakti rasa is different from ordinary rasa and on the contrary bhakti rasa is something which is never finishing which is eternal and that is where we discuss this word amrita so bhakti ras amrita amrita means it is it is long lasting it is eternal it it doesn't perishes it doesn't finishes that is where the word amrita comes mrit means dying amrita means which doesn't die so which doesn't diminishes so on contrary to ordinary rasa bhakti rasa is something which never finishes it is not temporary it continues to grow so that is what uh, is the difference between bhakti rasa and ordinary rasa <clears throat> ultimately we understood what is the subject matter of this book nectar of devotion and uh, we discussed several statements of shila prabhupad mentioned in the preface so uh, the various subject matter of nectar of devotion is understand what is bhakti rasa understand what is process of bhakti understand where to repose our loving propensity and here we discuss that we all want to love somebody and uh, when we want to love somebody when we repose our loving propensity in some relationship in some activity etc ultimately we find that it is temporary it is fleeting it is not permanent and so on but when we repose our loving propensity in krishna in the supreme personality of godhead then we find that all the departments of our life actually brightens up we are very very happy so how to repose where to repose and how to love supreme lord krishna these are the subject matter of this book called nectar of devotion so that is how we in a in a nutshell we understood the preface and in this slide i have broadly classified the preface in three categories history of the book history of the author shila rup goswami and primary subject matter of nectar of devotion which is bhakti rasa and in this slide very briefly uh, summarizes the difference between material rasa and bhakti rasa we have already discussed in our summary uh, so we will not discuss that now we come to structure of introduction so introduction uh, is where the actual book starts so actual book is uh, this book which i was showing to you last time uh, bhakti rasamrit sindhu uh, so you can see this book this book is uh, what i'm showing you uh, in front of uh, the class is uh, the commentary uh, by shila jeev goswami and shila vishwanath chakravarti thakur so this has been translated by his holiness bhanu maharaj so bhanu maharaj is a sanyasi in our movement and these two commentaries on bhakti rasamrit sindhu one by jeev goswami and another by shila vishwanath chakravarti thakur both of them have been very very prominent vaishnavas in in our body of vaishnav tradition so both of them have written commentary on bhakti rasamrit sindhu written by shila jeev shila roop goswami and both these commentaries are in sanskrit language so what bhanu maharaj has done he has translated the sanskrit into english and has compiled this book called 
Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu, uh, translated by His Holiness Bhanu Swami. So this is the book which I am referring to uh, to teach this course. And uh, Nectar of Devotion, as I was mentioning to you, is a book by uh, Shila Prabhupada, which is a summary study. So in this book, Nectar of Devotion, Shila Prabhupada has written an introduction. After preface, he has written an introduction. So this slide is telling you about the introduction as Shila Prabhupada has written. Uh, so <clears throat> in the original book, Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu, uh, the first 12 verses, the first 12 shlokas in the original book have been covered by Shila Prabhupada in this chapter, which is titled as Introduction to Nectar of Devotion. And when you Un, uh, when you kind of uh, try to decipher the structure of this uh, chapter introduction, you will find there are three main subject matter discussed here. One, the first one is Mangalacharan. Mangalacharan means invoking auspiciousness. So it is something like a prayer, which the author of the book, Bhaktir Samrat Sindhu, uh, is offering uh, to invoke auspiciousness. Like in uh, Vedic tradition, Whenever we are starting a work, a new activity, uh, we want to do something auspicious. We uh, invoke auspicious by chanting some prayers. So this Mangala Charan is a special Mangala is, is a special prayer at the beginning of the book, and it has a specific nature which we will study in the in the class today. Then uh, the author himself describes what are the broad contents of the book and what is the scope of the book. So that is also covered uh, in today's class and in the chapter introduction by Shila Prabhupada. Then uh, in the 11th verse of Bhaktir Samrat Sindhu, the author Shila Rup Goswami gives a definition of pure devotional service, Uttama Bhakti. He gives the definition of pure devotional service. So definitions are very, very important for understanding the subject matter. In fact, if you see Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu is full of definitions. So why definition? We need to understand the definition as given by the Acharya so that we don't get distracted or we don't get confused by some other meaning of, uh, of, of, of a particular word. For example, the word Bhakti is also used in the context of country, like we say Desh Bhakt or Desh Bhakti. So is Desh Bhakti really Bhakti as described by Shila Rupa Goswami? So in order to have a clear cut answer, what falls into, into the purview of Bhakti and what doesn't fall into the purview of Bhakti, we need to have a clear cut definition of Bhakti. And Uttama Bhakti has been defined in, uh, in, in, in the introduction by Chila Prabhupada. Uttama Bhakti means first class devotional service. So there could be second class devotional service or maybe third class devotional service. But what he's defining here is Uttama Bhakti means first class devotional service. So this is the introduction uh, or the structure of the introduction as given by Chila Prabhupada uh, in, in Nectar of Devotion. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the chapter introduction starts with a Mangala Charan, a prayer invoking auspiciousness. So let us first of all understand why this Mangala Charan is done. What are the typical elements of Mangala Charan? So in this Mangala Charan that is done in Bhaktir Samrat Sindhu, the very first uh, verse, there is an objective of Mangalacharan. Objective means what is the purpose of this book? So that objective you will see in the Mangalacharan. Then while invoking auspiciousness, we uh, the, the author of the book is paying his respects to a certain deity, to a, to a certain object, worshipable object. Uh, and here he is worshipping uh, Lord Krishna. But he is worshipping Lord Krishna or paying his respects to Lord Krishna in a particular mood, in a specific mood. 
that also we will try to see what specific that mood is and that mood actually also connects with the objective of the mangala charan then the third idea is or the third aspect of this mangala charan is offering benediction so what is the what is the result that the author want to derive from the study of this book no? so he is offering some benediction uh, in this mangala charan so let us now see what is that mangala charan now when you see this slide you will i will like to identify a few things here in the slide so mangala charan is the verse number 1 of uh, chapter number 1 of bhakti rasamrit sindhu and brs this is uh, acronym for bhakti rasamrit sindhu and in the bracket you see p1 so p1 is signif signifying or referring to paragraph number 1 in this book called nectar of devotion uh, so shila prabhupada has written this summary study so the first paragraph is talking actually about the mangala charan written by shila roop goswami in this book bhakti rasamrit sindhu so that's how you need to understand uh, the various words here in in this slide now what is this mangala charan uh, i will recite this akhil rasamrit murti hi प्रसरमर रुचि रुद्ध तारक पालिका कलित श्याम ललित राधा प्रियान विधुर जयति अखिल रसामृत मूर्ति प्रसरमर रुचि रुद्ध तारक पाली लाइक दैट कलित श्याम ललित राधा प्रियान विधुर जयति सो आई हैव ब्रोकन डाउन दिस वर्स इन टू वेरियस कलर्स and you will primarily see four colors akhil rasamrat murti hi and bidhur jayati these are in red color then prasramara ruchi ruddha tadaka pali this is in green then blue and then purple so there are four colors and there are four sentences if you step by step try to understand these four sentences you will understand the uh, purport and the meaning of mangala charan <clears throat> so let us see akhil rasamrat murti and vidhur jayati now akhil means all ras amrita means ras means we have already discussed this uh, in detail ras means uh, the those activities or those pleasure we derive from doing certain activities amrita amrita means which is nectarian which is full of bliss which is eternal never ending and so on murti hi means form hmm? so akhil rasamrit murti is something which author shila roop goswami is here referring to lord shri krishna and he is saying that lord shri krishna who is filled with all 12 rasas actually doesn't talk about 12 but later on we will discuss what are these rasas so he is talking about lord krishna who is completely filled with all the rasas all the 12 rasas and he has he is a murti murti means he has a form and what kind of form is this this form is supremely blissful that is the form so akhil rasamrit murti means lord krishna who is filled with all 12 rasas and has a supremely blissful form then the other part of this uh, first line is actually coming from vidhur jayati vidhur vidhur means the destroyer of all sins so this is vidhu is sanskrit and the meaning of this uh, sanskrit means vidhu means like in hindi we called dhona huh? dhona means washing what, what do we do by when we do washing but when we do washing we actually Uh, remove all kind of dirts all kind of bad things from the cloth that we are washing so similarly vidhur here means lord krishna who is destroyer of all sins who actually wash away all sins and by washing away all sins he is actually bestower of all the bliss all the bliss all happiness comes when when all the sins are destroyed and jayati jayati word means excels all others in glory so akhil rasamrit murti vidhur jayati so here lord uh, or uh, uh, shila roop goswami 
is offering his prayers to whom is offering his prayers to lord krishna whose akhilar samrat murti who is destroyer of all sins and bestower of all bliss and uh, not only he destroys sins he is he is bestower of bliss but actually he is excel he is excelling he is he is surpassing everyone in in doing this see he is surpassing everyone in uh, in in rasa he is surpassing everyone in destroying the sin he is surpassing everyone in bestowing all kind of bliss so this is akhil rasamrit murti bidhur jayati so this is the meaning of these uh, lines in the red then he has been described lord krishna now has been described because he is so he is filled with all rasas and he attracts everyone because he is filled with rasas so akhil rasamrit murti because he is filled with rasas he is very very attractive he attracts all and he attracts every living entity and primarily the kind of living entities uh, discussed in this uh, mangala charan are the gopis and the gopis have been classified into three categories so you see the first class of gopis is mentioned here prasramara ruchi ruddha tadaka palihi palika so tadaka and palika are actually gopis in krishna leela and what kind of gopis are they these gopis are those kind of gopis who get who come under the control of the attraction of lord krishna so lord krishna brings tadaka and palika under his control by diffusion of his beauty diffusion of his beauty means prasramara prasramara means radiation 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 means for example if there is a object which is very hot it radiates heat like the heater in in winters so diffusion ruchi ruchi is coming here for beauty ruddha ruddha is coming means under his control <clears throat> so lord krishna brings under his control who whom does he bring under his control tadaka and palika palika tadaka and palika are the gopis so lord krishna brings tadaka and palika under his control why because he is very beautiful and because he is radiating his beauty his form of akhila rasamrit murti is radiating beauty and because of that beauty he brings tadaka and palika the gopis under his control so this is first one class of gopis then the second class of gopis which is at the mid, mid middle level so this is at a lower level tadaka and palika at a lower level but at a middle level is shamala and lalita kalita shamala and kalita shama and lalito he accepts shamala and lalita as his equals now equals means lord krishna is also having an impact of his beauty on shamala and lalita and shamala and lalita also are having impact of their beauty on lord krishna so as equals he, he accepts shamala and lalita as his equals so this is second category the middle category but for radha but for shrimati radhika there is a different uh, relationship and gives pleasure to radha by his excellent qualities he gives pleasure to radha by his excellent qualities so in the other two categories he is actually receiving pleasure uh, from shamala and lalita and tadaka and palika but when it comes to shrimati radhika rani uh, lord krishna is actually giving pleasure to shrimati radhika rani by his excellent qualities so that is how shrimati radhika is at the topmost level so now you can see this mangala charan prayers you can understand the mangala charan prayers word by word sanskrit by sanskrit and how we can uh, how we can unfold the various various sections of this mangala charan prayers but what is the uh, what actually we are trying to achieve by understanding these mangala charan prayers hmm? so here you see what type of lord krishna has been discussed in these mangala charan prayers this is not lord krishna of kurukshetra who is giving knowledge of bhagavad gita to arjuna neither he is a lord krishna of dwarka who is ruling as a king 
so there is no opulence we can see in this uh, in this mangala charan we don't see any tinge of knowledge in this mangala charan uh, like krishna of kurukshetra who was speaking about bhagavad gita to arjuna what we see in this mangala charan is krishna of vrindavan he is being relating to gopis tadaka palika shamala lalita shrimati radhika so he is krishna of vrindavan which which means and dealing dealing with whom dealing with the gopis which means madhurya ras so he is krishna of vrindavan dealing with the gopis in madhurya ras also in this mangala charan prayer lord krishna has been addressed as akhil rasamrat murti hi so akhil rasamrat murti means <clears throat> he is completely filled with rasa not in a metaphorical sense it is not something like we are comparing krishna with some other object so he is like rasa no he is actually filled with rasa he is actually filled with those mellows with with that with that pleasure and what this rasa does this rasa attracts all living beings this rasa is attracting everyone like we get attracted to rasa we get attracted to beauty we get attracted to uh, various relationships and so on so who is krishna krishna has been described here as a person who is filled with rasa filled with all rasas not only one or two but all rasas in completeness since he is filled with all the rasas in completeness that is why he is able to attract all living beings and that is the meaning of the word krishna krishna word comes from the word akarshan akarshan means attraction and from the word akarshan comes the word krishna so that is why krishna is mentioned here is as akhil ras amrit murti hi a form which is filled with amrita of rasa amrita here means bliss because he is filled with all the rasas he is actually giving bliss giving pleasure to all the living beings and the kind of living beings discussed here is gopis so indirectly or through this mangala charan prayers what shila roop goswami is trying to say here is my dear lord krishna i am writing this book bhakti rasamrat sindhu the main subject matter of this book is bhakti rasa and since you are akhil rasamrat murti hi you are the object of all the rasas you are the destination of all the rasas so therefore i am offering my obeisances to you so you are the rasraj i am offering obeisances to you please have mercy on me so that i can do justice in writing this book on bhakti rasa so that is what shila roop goswami is saying so this is the meaning of the mangala charan prayers in bhakti rasa amrit sindhu which is captured in paragraph number 1 in the book nectar of devotion and verse number 1 in bhakti rasa amrit sindhu now you see the objective the whom he is paying obeisances and who what is the benediction he is trying to uh, ask from lord krishna so objective is to reveal bhakti rasa to people in the in the world that is the objective he is paying obeisances to whom to lord krishna and whom he is addressing as akhil rasamrat murti and what benediction he is requesting although not mentioned in the words but indirectly he is requesting lord krishna that like the gopis were attracted to you similarly i develop this bhakti rasa in me and similarly i get attracted to you o oh my dear lord so this is the benediction uh, he is he is requesting from lord krishna by offering his obeisances to lord krishna as akhila rasamrat murti in this mangala charan prayers <clears throat> so in the book uh, that we see uh, by bhanu maharaj in the commentary that he has written uh, english translation he has written on uh, translating shila jeev go swami's commentary he writes here uh, his unique feature which is the cause of all the qualities is his form of supreme bliss amrita murti hi since he contains all 12 rasas akhila rasa starting from shanta hmm? so what is the unique feature of lord krishna unique feature of lord krishna is amrit murti amrit murti means 
he is a form he has a form which is full of which is supreme full of supreme bliss huh? and that is why all other qualities come in lord krishna and why these qualities come because he contains all the 12 rasas akhil rasa starting from shanta so this is how uh, the commentary by shila jeev goswami is written and this is a translation given by bhanu maharaj now here what are the 12 rasas so we already know the five rasas shantaras dasyaras sakhyaras vatsalyaras and madhuryaras shant means neutral dasya means uh, serving the lord sakhya means serving the lord in as a friend vatsalya means serving the lord as a as a parent and madhurya ras ras means serving the lord as a lover but besides these five main rasas there are other seven rasas which are hasya in english we call it comedy karuna means compassion bhayanaka which means fear something which invokes fear in our heart veer veer means chivalry means like bravery bibats bibats means ghastliness and vismaya vismaya means wonder and raudra raudra means devastation so lord krishna is a form uh, akhil ras amrit murti ras akhil ras means all the rasas so all 12 rasas are there in lord krishna and this is the uh, description of these 12 rasas so this is if you read paragraph number 1 in nectar of devotion you will you will see how shila prabhupad has very uh, very sweetly in in a very short way have summarized that one paragraph to explain everything that we just now discussed now we will come to the second verse of bhakti rasamrit sindhu and in this second verse shila rup goswami has done chaitanya vandana chaitanya vandana means he has offered his pranams to chaitanya mahaprabhu he says i offer my respects to the lotus feet of supreme lord in the form of chaitanya dev though i am a wild person by nature by his inspiration within my heart i have undertaken this work so he is offering his pranams to chaitanya mahaprabhu and he is considering himself a very wild person by nature wild person by nature means a very low person by nature so we know that actually roop goswami is a very exalted vaishnava he is not wild it is actually uh, roop goswami's humility that we see in this in this verse so shila roop shila prabhupad offers obeisances to shila roop goswami and also shila bhakti siddhant saraswati thakur in paragraph number 2 <clears throat> so uh, in the in in uh, in nectar of devotion uh, there is no specific mention of uh, uh, that uh, roop goswami is mentioning of uh, pranams to chaitanya mahaprabhu but uh, uh, it is mentioned in the book bhakti rasamrit sindhu instead of offering pranams to chaitanya mahaprabhu or mention mentioning that chaitanya mahaprabhu is being offered pranams by shila roop goswami in the paragraph number 2 of nectar of devotion uh, shila prabhupad is offering obeisances to shila roop goswami and shila bhakti siddhant saraswati thakur his own spiritual master so that is what i have mentioned here in paragraph number 2 <clears throat> now coming to the third verse of bhakti rasamrit sindhu which is coinciding with the paragraph number 3 in the introduction by uh, shila prabhupad here he mentions about that shila roop goswami is offering guru vandana to his elder brother and who is elder brother of shila roop goswami sanatan goswami so roop goswami is considering sanatan goswami his elder brother as his uh, spiritual master his guru and he is offering his pranams to sanatan goswami he is saying may this bhakti rasamrit sindhu always serve as the transcendental recreation hall that is vishram mandir of my lord sanatan goswami for his pleasure what he is trying to say that if sanatan goswami read this book he should find pleasure uh, he should find pleasure by reading this book uh, so for his pleasure actually i am i am i am writing this book and i am offering my vandana i am offering my prayers to my elder brother and my guru sanatan goswami so that is the third verse of bhakti rasamrit sindhu which coincides with the description uh, by shila prabhupad in paragraph number 3 of the introduction of nectar of devotion <clears throat> now 
the fourth verse in the fourth verse shila roop goswami offers vandana offers pranam to the vaishnavas general devotees the vaishnavas and this verse is a very very sweet verse is a very special verse where he is describing the vaishnavas in a very special way so it is important for us to understand this verse in a little more detail compared to the other verses which we have not understood in much more detail so this fourth verse in bhaktir samrat sindhu actually coincides with the paragraph number 4 in nectar of devotion so the verse goes like this bhakti rasamrat sindhu charatah paribhuta kal jal bhiyah bhakta makaran ashlita mukti nadikan namasyami 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 stands for i offer my obeisances now to whom i offer my obeisances is mentioned in other uh, other five uh, other four lines so the we will go line by line bhakti rasamrat charatah so we know that he is offering to offering his obeisances to bhakta bhakta means the vaishnavas and what is uh, shila roop goswami de- describing as bhaktas how he is describing bhaktas he is saying those bhaktas who are bhakti rasamrat sindhu charatah charata means enjoying uh, he, they are swimming they are swimming where they are swimming they are swimming in the bhakti rasamrat sindhu they are swimming in the sweet ocean of bhakti ras huh? so that is the first quality of the vaishnavas he is describing in this verse then second quality is described as paribhut kal jal bhiya kal jal kal means time jal means net hmm? bhiya means fear huh? so paribhut means disregard so these bhaktas these devotees these vaishnavas are such they don't have any fear of time they don't fear from kal so what is the nature of kal the nature of kal is to destroy but bhaktas because they are situated in the loving devotional service of the lord they actually are not fearful of any destruction any death so kal jal bhiya the the best the worst a uh, fear of destruction of kal or time is death so these devotees are such that they don't have any bhay any fear of kal jal huh? so this they disregard the fear caused by the net of time then bhakta makaran so bhakta makaran so these bhaktas these vaishnavas are like makara makara is a fish in the ocean which is considered as the king among fishes so for example in the modern day description we can consider whale uh, which is very big in size to be the king of fishes in the ocean but in the vedic literature we 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 find this uh, word called makara uh, for those kind of a fish which is actually king among fishes so they are like makara king among fishes if you remember in bhagavad gita also where in chapter number 10 where lord krishna is Uh, in in the in the vibhuti yoga he is comparing that among fishes i am makara so like that he considered makara as the topmost fish so these bhaktas these vaishnavas are like makara which are kings among fishes then other quality of these vaishnavas is ashlita ashlita mukti nadikan so the word nadikan is coming from the word nadi nadi means river nadikan means plural many rivers mukti nadikan mukti means liberation so there are many many ways to get liberation many many ways many many paths so these there are many many rivers so this uh, many paths of liberation is co- compared here to nadikan now you see here nadi and sindhu nadi means a body uh, a water body which contains water but compared to ocean compared to ocean the nadi or river has very small quantity of water so mukti compared to the devotional service or devotion is compared to a nadi and devotion is compared to a sindhu so these devotees are like kings are king among fishes they don't like to enjoy in the nadis they don't like to enjoy in the rivers rather 
they like to enjoy in the bhakti ras amrit sindhu they like to enjoy in the ocean so to such devotees to such vaishnavas i offer my obeisances so you can see here in this vaishnav vandana shila roop goswami is comparing vaishnavas to makara who is frolicking who is enjoying in the ocean of bhakti and then they are ignoring they are disregarding kal jal bhaya and they are also disregarding mukti yeah? the the small small rivers of mukti so here you can see i have summarized this uh, this comparison of uh, devotees or vaishnavas with makara yeah? in three ways uh, so i have summarized here joyfully swimming in the unlimited ocean of bhakti rasa hmm? they are not like merging uh, like impersonalists but they delight in serving the lord so for example when the river come to the ocean so the river leave uh, river loses its identity river merges with the ocean so similarly the impersonalists also also want to merge with the brahman the uh, the uh, uh, a uniform brahman there is which, which does not have any form formless brahman so impersonalists want to merge with formless brahman but devotees don't want to merge with that formless brahman rather they want to maintain their identity they want to swim in this ocean of bhakti and they delight in serving the lord so this is the difference so joyfully swimming in the unlimited ocean of bhakti rasa then they ignore liberation uh, like rivers with very limited water so happiness of merging is compared to uh, happiness of merging with brahman is compared to uh, a, a river so river is also giving us happiness the river also is very useful but the utility of river is much less compared to the utility of ocean yeah? so similarly here the happiness of merging of brahman is compared to river which has a very limited water rather the devotees like to enjoy in the endless and the vast ocean of bhakti uh, like bhakti rasamrit sindhu similarly the third one is disregard the fear arising from time's net now how do these makara or these fishes disregard the fear of net like in the ocean there are many uh, fishermen who go into the ocean and they put a net in the ocean and they catch fish so these fishermen are only able to catch fishes which are only uh, swimming in the on the surface of the ocean but these devotees are actually like makara they are kings among the fishes they don't like to uh, they, they don't like to swim at the surface of the ocean they like to swim deep inside the ocean where the net of the fishermen cannot come so that is why they disregard the fear arising from the times net so that is how they are compared to the makara fish so they are makara fish they are special fishes who is who, who enjoy deep inside the ocean and that that's how they escape the net of the fishermen and similarly the devotees escape the net of the time yeah, because they are lovingly and transcendently situated in the loving devotional service of the lord so this is the uh, fourth verse where uh, shila roop goswami is offering vaishnav vandana now coming uh, to the fifth verse which corresponds to the fifth paragraph in uh, nectar of devotion here roop goswami is praying to sanatan goswami his guru and his elder brother for protection of bhakti rasamrit sindhu and from whom he wants to protect bhakti rasamrit sindhu he wants protection from mimamsakas mimamsakas means philosophers philosophers means who are only thinking about various philosophies various theses and so on and here he is mainly talking about philosophers by proponents of gyana and karma so people who are talking about uh, merging into impersonal brahman people are talking about karma karma kanda etc etc so rupa goswami is praying to his guru sanatan goswami please protect bhakti rasamrit sindhu from mimamsakas so comparing the mimamsakas to volcanic fire in the middle of ocean so if you read this verse 
here these mimamsakas have been compared to the volcanoes so in the ocean there is a volcano and when the volcano erupts there is a fire from these volcanoes but these fire cannot do anything to the ocean because ocean is filled with water and unlimited water so even if there are mimamsakas of uh, who are compared with the volcanoes and they are putting fire fire means there are various different different philosophies but because it is surrounded by bhakti rasamrit sindhu uh, this ocean uh, this fire cannot harm the ocean because it contains large quantity of water so this is how in the fifth verse uh, shila roop goswami is praying to sanatan goswami for protection of this book bhakti rasamrit sindhu from mimamsakas of jnana and karma now in the sixth verse which actually corresponds to the sixth paragraph in nectar of devotion shila roop goswami uh, is uh, is actually uh, uh, acting as a very humble person he is showing his very humil he is showing himself in a very humble humble light uh, he calls himself that he is actually very very unfit to do this work is writing this great work bhakti rasamrit sindhu to to explain bhakti rasa to the people at large but he is finding very very humble he is finding himself very very unfit to do this work and and prabhupad in his uh, in his summary study in paragraph number 6 he is mentioning that this should be the attitude of all preachers of krishna consciousness when we are going out to preach krishna bhakti that should be the attitude like the attitude we see by shila roop goswami in this particular verse verse number 6 prabhupad writes we should never think of ourselves as great preachers but should always consider that we are simply instrumental to the previous acharyas and simply by following in their footsteps we may be able to do something for the benefit of suffering humanity so here we can see the mood of humility in roop goswami the author of bhakti rasamrit sindhu in verse number 6 of chapter number 1 <clears throat> now from verse number 7 to 9 of bhakti rasamrit sindhu the author shila roop goswami briefly explains the subject matter and the scope of this book bhakti rasamrit sindhu so like in ocean Uh, a very vast ocean there are four directions in an ocean east direction west direction north direction and south direction so this whole book bhakti rasamrit sindhu is actually divided into four parts four divisions now what you see in my hand is only description about the east direction so Uh, when you will purchase this book bhakti samrat sindhu as translated by bhanu maharaj you will find four books so in this particular class in this particular course we are only going to study about the east or only about this first book uh, which which you see in my hand huh? so this is part 1 of uh, of the whole literature so there are four divisions east west north south in this course we are going to study only the eastern part <clears throat> so what is there in the eastern part now in the ocean we see there are four directions and each part in the ocean there are different different waves so these waves have been compared with the chapters of of this book so in the eastern division there are four chapters four waves what are these four waves so the first chapter describes about samanya bhakti samanya means general bhakti in general Des general description of bhakti is being discussed in the first chapter which we are studying right now then in the second wave or second chapter we were studying about sadhana bhakti sadhana bhakti means bhakti in practice bhakti in practice means what are the various activities we voluntarily accept as part of our bhakti practice and its various types bhakti in practice and its various types then bhav bhakti bhav bhakti means bhakti in ecstasy bhav bhakti bhakti mean ecstasy means when we we don't have 
spontaneous loving uh, emotion towards lord krishna right now we don't have but when we start to do sadhana bhakti when we start to do various practices in bhakti uh, as rules and regulations slowly and gradually we start to get that bhav we start to get that ecstasy in our bhakti and ultimately prema bhakti so ultimately this bhav or this uh, emotion is spontaneous emotion it starts to convert towards love of god and that is prema bhakti so uh, the overall scope of this book is it has four divisions east west north and south we are going to study only eastern division and in eastern division there are four chapters samanya bhakti sadhana bhakti bhav bhakti and prema bhakti then in the 10th verse shila rup goswami makes an introductory remark for chapter number 1 which is samanya bhakti of bhaktir samrat sindhu he just give a little introductory remark what he says uttama bhakti lakshanam or unique characteristics of pure devotional service are described in the first chapter to establish the supreme position of bhakti so here uttama bhakti lakshanam uttama bhakti means what is first class devotional service is described in general and how first class devotional service is actually best form of connecting with the lord and its supreme position has been established that is a general introductory remark shila rup goswami makes in the 10th verse of bhaktir samrat sindhu and in the 11th verse comes the most important shloka of this chapter where shila rup goswami has given the definition of uttama bhakti definition of first class sir, devotional service <clears throat> and this is the most important verse of today's class and i would say uh, the most important verse also of the first chapter of the eastern division hmm? the samanya bhakti so let us discuss this samanya bhakti or the definition of uttama bhakti in little detail what this verse says is anya bhilashita shunyam gyan karma dhyana arvatam anukulena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama so we have discussed this verse in our previous classes also but we will discuss this verse once again as part of our study of nectar of devotion and you would see shila prabhupad has spent paragraph number 8 till paragraph number 22 to discuss only this one verse so you can understand how much importance shila prabhupad is focusing or giving to this one particular verse uh, which comes in as 11th verse of bhaktir samrat sindhu so almost you can see uh, 22 minus 8 would be 14 uh, so 15 paragraphs he has spent only to discuss this definition of uttama bhakti so it is important for us to at least give some 5 10 minutes on understanding this particular verse <clears throat> he says anyabilashita shunyam gyan karma dyanavratam anukulena krishnanu shilanam bhaktir uttama so let us discuss bhaktir uttama means uttama means the best or pure so what is bhaktir uttama is discussed in these first three sections in blue in red and in green so what is the uh uh what does it say now let us discuss each of these parts uh, let us let us first of all discuss the green one krishna anushilanam one should render transcendental loving service to the supreme lord krishna krishna anushilanam shilanam means shilanam means service and krishna means lord krishna so what is uttama bhakti uttama bhakti means service to lord krishna oh rehta hai exam exam ka अनुशीलनम शीलनम मीन्स uh doing some activity 
Anu means doing that activity under the guidance. And Krishna, whom should we do this activity for? We should do this activity for Lord Krishna. So this is the meaning of line, uh, the phrase in green here. Then, uh, now there are different, different other characteristics, other adjectives are going to be attached to Krishna Anushilanam. What are those adjectives? So one adjective is Anukulena. Anukulena means the service should be favorable and devoid of any hostility. It should be favorable. And what does that favorable means? That means it should be devoid of any hostility. So clarifying what does favorable mean? Devoid of any hostility. For whom? For Lord Krishna. We will discuss each of these words in detail in coming slides. But just to give you an overview in this slide. Then, Anya Abhilashita Shunyam Gyan Karmadi Anavritam. Now, Anya Abhilashita Shunyam. Anya Abhilashita Shunyam means, Abhilasha means desire. Anya means other. Without desire for other, without having other desires. Shunyam means zero. So, other desire should be zero. So, this is one part. And without desire, on what kind of desires? Gyan karmadi anavritam. Hmm? Which desires which are devoid of any material profit. Uh, and then any philosophical speculation. Philosophical speculation is jnana. And material profit through pro fruitive activities act actually karma. So anya bhilashita shunyam gyan karmadi anavritam anukulena krishnanu anushilanam bhakti ruttama. So this is giving you a little overview of the definition of pure devotional service. Now let us discuss more details about this verse. The first thing we should understand about this verse is the first line of this verse is talking about the secondary characteristics of bhakti. And the bottom line anukulena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama is talking about the primary characteristics of uttama bhakti. So, we will start our discussion by first of all unfolding the bottom line first. And we will go in a reverse direction. Bhaktir Uttama means what is pure devotional service. And first of all, we will discuss what is Shilanam. Then we will discuss what is Anu Shilanam. Then what is Krishna Anu Shilanam. And then Anu Kulena Krishna Anu Shilanam. Like that we will discuss step by step. And then we will discuss about Anya Bhilashita Shunyam and then Gyan Karmadya Anavritam. So like that, in step by step, we will discuss each of these, each of these uh, Sanskrit texts. So first of all, as I mentioned, Krishna Anu Shilanam. Krishna Anu Shilanam means, as I said, we will discuss Shilanam first. Shilanam means cultivation. Cultivation generally comes uh, when we talk about like, for example, we are cultivating something, we are, we are developing something, we are doing something. So when we talk about cultivation, we are talking about activity. So bhakti is not something which is only an emotion, which is only some thought, which is only some feeling. No. Shilanam means it is an activity. Krishna Anu Shilanam. So first of all, Shilanam means cultivation and cultivation means activity. We want to cultivate some emotion. For that, we need to do some activity. Anu Shilanam means, Anu means Anusar, accordingly. Accordingly means under some guidance. So under some guidance means it is not like we will do this Anu Shilanam by our own ideas, by our own fancies. No, we will do this Shilanam by following certain rules and regulation as described by uh, the scriptures, as described by the Acharyas, by Vaishnavas, by senior uh, uh, devotees, leaders, and so on. Cultivation, it is an activity, and this activity has to be done uh, by following certain rules and regulation by under certain guidance. Uh, that is Anu Shilanam. <clears throat> now, little more detail about Shilanam means, Shilanam can be actively done or Shilanam can be inactively done. Actively done means we actively engage our body in some activity. We actively engage our mind in, in thinking, in feeling, in willing, 
Uh, willing means we want to do something. Feeling means we we have some feelings, we have some emotions, uh, and and thinking means we are we are we are thinking about bhakti and so on. So mind has three things: thinking, feeling, and willing. Body means using our senses, using using our body parts, using our limbs, hands, eyes, ears, and so on, and words. Words means speaking about Lord. is speaking about lord doing some kirtana doing some glorification of the lord and so on so this is active uh, shilanam it has a active component and it also has an inactive component inactive component means avoiding we don't do something when we don't do something we are not making doing some action but that is something uh, this activity has two parts actively doing something but inactively doing something for example avoiding avoiding means <clears throat> say for example we don't talk up, talk ill about we, we don't do blasphemy of the lord we don't do blasphemy of the devotees yeah? we don't eat certain foods we avoid certain foods we avoid certain association like that so it has an active part and it has an inactive part which means avoiding then krishna anushilanam so shilanam then anushilanam then finally krishna anushilanam so what does krishna anushilanam means krishna anushilanam means that this activity this following of rules and regulations uh, uh, has to be done for whom it has to be done for krishna and what does krishna means krishna means lord krishna like we see in the uh, uh, in the leela and past times of radha and krishna lord krishna supreme personality of godhead son of uh, uh, vasudev so that is lord krishna so so it includes krishna means when it says krishna anushilam it not only includes lord krishna but also his expansions expansion means lord ramchandra lord vishnu lord narsingha dev lord varaha lord vaman dev and so on hmm? and then also included are persons related to krishna person related to krishna means guru our teacher our spiritual master they are also included when we say krishna anushilanam so the ambit of bhakti the definition of bhakti means krishna anushilanam what it does not include for example desh bhakti we hear this word lot many times uh, in our life desh bhakti so desh bhakti does not fall under the definition of uttama bhakti it is not part of uttama bhakti so desh bhakti is not approved under this definition or any other type of bhakti you might see uh, it will not fall under this in this definition so it is purely about krishna or his expansions or people related to krishna like our spiritual master or teacher <clears throat> so this is the meaning of krishna anushilanam now going for further anukulena anukulena it is not anukulena it is anukulena anukulena means favorable attitude towards lord krishna favorable attitude and in order to further clarify what is what do you mean by favorable attitude further it is mentioned devoid of any hostility devoid of any hostility hmm? so uh, why we want to understand devoid of hostility i will explain you with the help of an example but what it means is that our intention also matter not only we are doing some service we are doing actively uh, something by our body by our mind by our words our intention should also be favorable intention matters attitude towards krishna should be favorable right yeah? and then we say devoid of hostility devoid of hostility is mainly to clarify one important aspect now i'll give you two situations here sometimes we see that there are demons who when they fight with krishna gives lot of pleasure to lord krishna like for example when ravan was fighting with lord ram it was giving pleasure to lord ram and that's why lord vishnu actually appeared as lord ram chandra because he wanted to have that pleasure of fighting with a with with somebody who is equal to him yeah, like jay and vijay so we see demons uh, when they fight with the lord 
sometimes it give very pleasure to the lord so somebody might challenge that since it is giving pleasure to the lord so if i fight with the lord it will give pleasure to the lord so that means it is favorable to the lord so is it bhakti no it is not bhakti why it is not bhakti because it is filled with hostility it is filled with hostility so favorable attitude which is devoid of any hostility will fall under the definition of pure bhakti uttama bhakti so krishna finding pleasure in fighting with demons this is not an example of bhakti so ravan when he fights with lord ram is not doing bhakti hiranyakashipu when he is fighting with the varadev is not bhakti or kamsa is fighting with lord krishna is not bhakti although kamsa is thinking about krishna kamsa is doing some activity for krishna he is doing fighting with krishna but since it is not favorable it is not it is not devoid of any hostility it does not fall into the definition of bhakti sometimes also now let us see another example we find in damodar leela we see yashoda mai uh leaving lord krishna in the kitchen and going to uh, or leaving lord krishna in the room and going to the kitchen to attend the boiling milk and when this happened lord krishna became very angry uh, here mother yashoda has made lord krishna very angry so is mother yashoda doing bhakti for lord krishna yes she is doing bhakti for lord krishna why because her attitude is devoid of any hostility although lord krishna became angry but since mother's yashoda's attitude is devoid of any hostility towards lord krishna it will fall under the definition of uttama bhakti it will be called as bhakti <clears throat> so now we already discussed krishna anushilanam we discuss now anukulena krishna anushilanam what does these two line means this line means both our attitude and action should be pleasing to krishna so this is definition of uttama bhakti so now we are what we have covered in our definition of uttama bhakti we have covered anukulena krishna anushilanam we have discussed primary characteristic of uttama bhakti now we will go to the secondary characteristic this is the secondary which means uh, this is the main main definition this should be the main thing main thrust but side like we have main course we have desert huh? so this is something like a side second secondary characteristic so in the secondary characteristic first of all we discuss anya abhilashita shunyam anya abhilashita shunyam which means free from material desires in short it means free from material desires desire only should be for serving krishna favorable to krishna if we have that desire we have that activity that is something uttama bhakti but other than that that is called anya abhilashita shunyam shunyam means zero we should not have desire other than serving lord krishna favorably devoid of any hostility that is something shunyam and anya is also other desires material desires but here like to bring to your notice the word used is anya abhilashita anya abhilashita rupa goswami has not used the word anya abhilasha shunyam so there is a difference there is a subtle difference between anya abhilashita and anya abhilasha so abhilasha versus abhilashita we need to understand that so here abhilasha means material desire but abhilashita means tendency to have that material desire tendency to have that material desire now in a, as an example draupadi queen draupadi was also devotee of lord krishna but when queen draupadi was being disrobed in the court she uh, prayed for his protection prayed for her protection to to lord krishna so now he is praying for something protection which is which may be considered as material so it is not praying for uh, service for krishna he is not praying for she is not praying for any devotion for lord krishna she is praying for her protection from lord krishna 
now here <clears throat> uh, what is described is temporary and circumstantial desires for self preservation do not put a devotee out of the realm of uttama bhakti so what rupa swami is trying to say is that in some emergency situation devotee may desire some protection uh, that may be for her own self preservation the devotee may desire from the lord for his own protection for protection of his life for protection of his chastity etc etc in such circumstantial situations and temporary situations which may be temporary means they are not always they are only once in a while in our life and circumstantial means because of some emergency circumstances we may desire like so a devotee may desire like so so if a desire like that come that actually should be avoided or or, or should be uh, should not be considered as a material desire uh, so that is why the word used here is an abhilashita abhilashita means tendency to have a material desire uh, in a in a circumstance in a emergency circumstance which may be temporary in nature if we if a devotee desire like that then that desire is acceptable that material desire is acceptable and doesn't mean that the devotee is doing something material desire and he should be not considered in the realm of uttama bhakti so now we are going into more details of what is pure bhakti so we talked about uh, krishna anushilanam and anupulena now we are talking about anya abhilashita shunyam where we just discussed about a subtle difference between abhilasha and abhilashita so you understand that so abhilashita means tendency to have material desire in some emergency situation and abhilasha broadly means material desire material desire means regularly having that desire always having some desire like material desire okay now coming to the uh, last phrase gyan karma adi so gyan karma and adi anavrutam anavrutam means uncover so here you see in the previous verse in the previous phrase we talked about shunyam shunyam means zero so anya abhilasha anya abhilasha means other material desires should be zero but here for gyan and karma it is not shunya it is talking about anavrutam anavrutam means gyan and karma should be there in bhakti gyan means understanding about supreme lord krishna that gyan is acceptable but gyan about impersonal brahman merging into impersonal brahman that gyan is not acceptable in bhakti so gyan for gyan it is not mentioned shunya there has to be gyan but some gyan has to be avoided and that has to be uncovered that has to be rejected what kind of gyan should be rejected about impersonal brahman merging into impersonal brahman that gyan should be rejected karma karma means activity doing some activity doing some karma doing some work so that is uh, anushilanam uh, we talked about cultivation doing some activity so karma is not to be meant zero but some karma some activities has to be uncovered has to be avoided and what kind of karma is that that karma is described as nitya and naimittaka karmas done in varnashrama so as part of varnashrama varnashrama means as part of grahastha ashrama for example we are supposed to do certain duties for example a grahastha a householder is supposed to do charity a householder is supposed to do some uh, 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 to observe some fasting some vratas he has to do some shraddha shraddha of his ancestors so these are some duties described in varnashrama so nitya and namittika karmas done in varna varnashrama like charity vrata shraddha should be uncovered should be avoided or should be uh, should not be uh, considered as absolute should not be considered as the prime goal of life so that is that is what uh, actually it means karma nitya and namittika karmas done in varnashrama Uh, should be avoided <clears throat> should be uncovered then adi adi means gyan karma and etc etc adi means etc what all 
like for example yajna maybe renunciation like vairagya like talking about yoga yoga means mysticism mysticism means acquiring siddhis becoming perfect like we become lighter than the light we become heavier than the heavy and so on so these are various siddhis in yoga and sankhya sankhya means analysis only talking about uh, uh, this is uh, earth fire water air detailed discussion detail understanding about all these things and and so on so that falls under the category of adi so gyan karma adi anavrutam anavrutam as i as i'm mentioning to you it is not shunyam here it is anavrutam anavrutam means uncover avoiding so nitya karma done with absolute faith out of fear of sin is covering on bhakti so what it means is you might say that charity is good bratas of offering or observing fasting is good offering our shraddha to our ancestor is good yes it is good but considering these activities as absolute absolute means as the topmost is something which is considered as covering on bhakti so our understanding should be very clear we can do these activities devotees can do the activities of charity can do the activity of observing fasting do the activities of offering shraddha to their ancestors but devotees should not consider these activities as the absolute ultimate goal of bhakti absolute ultimate goal of bhakti is krishna anushilanam anukulena krishna anushilanam is the primary characteristic of bhakti so that is why this is uh, anavrutam is cat, uh, is considered or is categorized in the secondary part of the of this verse so if if the devotees are engaging in these activities of charity in the activities of fasting in the activities of shraddha etc etc then the devotee should do these activities from the consciousness from the uh, understanding that actually i am doing this activity to teach common people i am doing this activity to teach common people to offer or to observe some dharmic uh, way of life so to offer some dharmic way of life as a, setting up an example in that category they should do this activity like krishna mentioned to arjuna fight this war because if you fight this war you will set up as an example to the people at large but then lord krishna raised the consciousness of arjuna to a higher level in the 18th chapter he says sarva dharman parityajye mam ekam sharanam bhaja so in the beginning of gita he is teaching uh, he is teaching to fight fight his uh, and observe his duty as a kshatriya but in the end he is talking about sharanam he is talking about surrender that is means devotional service to lord krishna as the ultimate objective so what arjuna should do arjuna should fight the war but consider that fighting the war as his devotional service to lord krishna so if we are doing charity as considering it is a devotional service to krishna it is bhakti if you are offering observing fast as a uh, as a activity which is pleasing krishna then it is bhakti we are doing shraddha to our ancestors but considering offering a shraddha uh, as activity devotional to lord krishna then it is actually falling under the jurisdiction of uttama bhakti so like that gyan karma adi anavrutam is the secondary part of this verse which has been discussed here <clears throat> now coming to the final slide of the today's class which is the 12th verse and that is what shila prabhupad has summarized in paragraph number 23 of introduction here rup goswami in the in the 12th verse of bhaktir samrat sindhu quotes one verse from narad pancharatra so as i mentioned to you in the beginning of the class uh, shila rup goswami's objective was to write books and how is writing books he is writing books by picking up references from vedic literature so in the 12th verse he is picking up a reference from narad pancharatra and quoting that verse in his book bhaktir samrat sindhu and why he is quoting this verse he is quoting this verse by to tell us that a very similar verse by narad muni another uttama bhakta of lord krishna is actually saying the same thing 
in the Vedic literature. And when, what is that Vedic literature? That Vedic literature is Narad Pancharatra. So what is that verse? That verse is Sarvopadhi Vinirmuktam Tatparetvena Nirmalam Rishikena Rishikesha Sevanam Bhaktir Uchyate. So you see the Sanskrit here in the first uh, part of, of each bullet point. That is actually the verse number 12. But this verse is saying the same thing as mentioned in verse number 11, which is the definition of pure bhakti given by Srila Rupa Goswami. So how the, the verse mentioned in Narad Pancharatra is same uh, as verse number 11, the definition of Uttama Bhakti. Here, Narad Muni is saying, Sarvopadhi Vinur Muktvam, which is same as Anya Abhilashita Shunyam. Same as Anya Abhilashita Shunyam. Sarvopadhi means free from all upadhis. Vinir Muktvam means free. Sarva Upadhi means all designations. All design get free from all designation. Uh, designation of a husband to a wife, designation of a father to a son. Only consider yourself as a devotee of Lord Krishna. That is the only designation. So that means it is conveying the same mood as Anya Abhilashita Shunyam of verse number 11. Then Tat Paratvena. Para. Para means considering Lord Krishna as the Para, as the Supreme Lord. <clears throat> Tat Paratvena. Para, so that is indicating the same mood as Anukulena. Anukulena means favorable. Anukulena means favorable, devoid of any hostility. So Tat Paratvena means uh, the Bhakti should be done to please Krishna, taking him as the highest object. That Lord Krishna is the highest object. So that is indicative of Anukulena. Favorable, devoid of any hostility. Then Nirmalam. Nirmalam means Jnan Karmadi Anavratam. So Nirmalam means it should be Nirmal. It should be uh, unobstructed by any other process, which is the same mood as Jnan Karma Adi Anavratam. And then Rishikesha, Rishikesha, Rishikena, Rishikesha Sevanam. So Sevanam means some activity, some Seva. And that is what is known as Bhaktir Uchyate and Bhaktir Uttama. Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanam. Rishikena means, Rishik means senses. So using your senses, serve the Rishikesha, serve Lord Krishna. Sevanam means service. And that will be Bhaktir Uchyate, Anushilanam. So Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevanam is actually Anushilanam. And Bhaktir Uchyate means that is called as Bhakti, that is called as Uttama Bhakti. So what Rup Goswami has done in verse number 12 is he has quoted a reference from Vedic literature, Narat Pancharatra, to explain that what definition I have given you in verse number 11, actually the same thing has been mentioned by Narad Muni in Narat Pancharatra. And that is I am quoting here in verse number 12 of Bhakti Rasamrita. And which has been described by Srila Prabhupada in his paragraph number 23 of introduction chapter of Nectar of Devotion. So that is what, uh, dear devotees, the subject matter of class today of the introduction of Nectar of Devotion, uh, the book that we are now studying. So with that, all glories to the Nectar of Devotion, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Any question, any takeaways, any comments, you are most welcome now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for your attention. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Very nice class. Uh, uh, very good way of teaching the essence and boundaries of uh, Uttama Bhakti. Of course, uh, it is full of uh, contents and uh, numbers. Uh, mm. uh, we'll have to really work hard to decipher them, note them, follow them. Only then, when it becomes a routine, then it will be simplified. But right now, it appears that there are many components and we should be careful about what we are doing. And uh, yeah. thank yeah. you really very much for yeah. this brilliant talk. Yeah. So your, observation, your observation is very correct. So one observation you mentioned, uh, in a very polite way, saying that Bhakti Rasamrat Sindhu sounds to be a little complicated book. 
it is a it's a little complicated book that is very correct uh, your your observation is right and uh, it is all about definitions definitions means understanding each of these things like bhakti sadhana bhakti samanya bhakti uh, bhav bhakti prema bhakti it is giving right. it is full of definitions and when we are talking about definitions we should be very very clear about our limitations it has it has right. some water tight definition so if we have a clear cut definition we can develop the right understanding the accurate understanding and when we have that accurate understanding actually we can we can uh, practice the uh, devotional service the bhakti in a in a proper way in the rightful way so you are right uh, this becomes a little complicated when you uh, talk about the number of books like bhakti rasamrit sindhu or nectar of devotion that way it becomes a little difficult but once you start to focus and hear this lecture the the recording will be available hear the lecture yourself refer to the book to the various uh, discussions that we are having it will become very very clear to you <clears throat> and on top of it if you can purchase this book called bhakti rasamrit sindhu then it will be very very clear to you but even if you don't purchase this simply if you listen to our lecture and read the book uh, nectar of devotion by shila prabhupad uh, yeah. uh, you will get a very fairly good idea of what actually is being discussed in this book yeah thank you prabhu thank you ji thank you very much Are any Krishna other comments Prabhupada? yes anuradha mata ji yeah prabhu you said uh, fasting and then other things we doing ap- apart from that krishna's bhakti is important some that i didn't mm-hmm. understand prabhu yeah yeah so what i was trying to say mata ji is <clears throat> when we are talking about bhakti we discussed that did you understand that part that there are primary characteristic and there are secondary characteristic you understood that is prabhu so yeah main main part of bhakti is anukulena krishna anushilanam anushilanam means activity do something for krishna Uh, or his expansions or people related to krishna devotees guru spiritual master anukulena means it should be favorable activity our intention and our attitude should be favorable to krishna so that is anukulena krishna anushilanam that is bhakti the main the main idea of bhakti but when we talk about jnana uh, karma anavrtam jnana anavrtam karma anavrtam what do we, what does it mean so karma means there are many many type of fasts which sometime we do uh, uh, with not krishna in center hmm? so that kind of fasting if we try to do for example there are many fasts for example uh, ladies sometime do fast of uh, uh, this fast for example uh, uh, karva chauth yes ma'am karva chauth fast why do we do karva chauth fast mata ji for the husband uh, sake he long should life. be yeah long long life, life. Long life yes. of husband not yes. that that fasting if we are doing for long life of husband it is not krishna anushilanam it is husband anushilanam oh, oh on the for his sake we are doing that's why okay right so yeah. devotees devotees can also do this fast devotees yeah. my wife also do this fast of karva chauth mm. she also does this fast but she does this fast uh, with with this understanding that actually this fast is not the uh, ultimate goal of life okay ultimate goal of life is krishna anushilanam mm. and why she is doing this fast is she is doing fast doing this fast only to establish some example in the society okay sir that people it is not an anti devotional activity uh, caring for your husband worshiping for a long life of your husband is not something which is uh, against devotion but considering this activity to be the topmost activity of life is against devotion and has to be uncovered that is where the word anavratam comes that is where it has to be uncovered from our devotional activity so we can do that fasting but we should not consider that fast is uh, the absolute or we should not fear that if we don't do this fast we will be we will be getting sin no ah yes sir sometimes we feel like 
right mm. sometimes we feel like that yes. so that is if you are fearing that is you are covering your bhakti with karma we are covering this bhakti with that kind of namitik and nitya karmas mm. <clears throat> so like that so that's how we need to understand that okay thank you sir okay so i hope that is clear uh, i hope that that uh, that question was very good question and uh, with that example of karvacho that i gave you that yes, might sir. have brought uh, some clarity to your yes sir yes sir yes, yes. yes. thank you thank you any other question any other doubts hare hare krishna prabhu ji this is jeevan yes. prabhu prabhu here yes prabhu ji um now a new devotee has joined nalini amarish I have requested okay. her to join our uh, because she wanted okay. to read Nectar of Devotion. Then I okay, told ma'am. we have recently started this uh, Nectar yes. of Devotion. De- 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 I mean, this Lokas eh, by uh-huh. you. Okay. Then she has joined yeah. today. <clears throat> I think you let us welcome her. Okay, Nalini, Nalini Mataji, uh, we welcome you heart with with our all our heart and uh, uh, respects. So welcome to this class. I hope you will uh, you will take benefit of the discussions. we also have uh, videos available on youtube in case you are uh, finding it difficult to follow uh, maybe in the class then you can repeat and go and look back into the recording and understand it you are always welcome to ask questions uh, have discussions because we are discussing scriptures pure scriptures so i can understand that uh, things may not be easy for the first time but uh, we have all the facility available to for you to uh, communicate discuss and participate in this in this class so a very warm welcome thank you very much hari <clears throat> krishna prabhu ji yes vidya mata ji if you don't do bhakta hmm uh-huh. does that mean it is incomplete bhakti so there are vratas described mainly for doing bhakti for example following ekadashi vrata so ekadashi vrata is done for lord krishna on the ekadashi day and that is part of pure bhakti so we will discuss all these vratas fastings and so on more detail in our future classes but just for the sake uh, as i was explaining to anuradha mata ji like for example there are vratas uh, like recently uh, we we saw that satyagraha the mahatma gandhi did vratas for independence of india You, you remember you you know that yes yes now that vrata is not under the category of uttama bhakti uh, that that vrata is uh, falling under the category of uh, karma uh, karma uh, uh, something like a something like observing fasting or hunger just for a purpose of independence of a nation that is not that is not uh, and considering these kind of activities as the absolute activities of one's life or the uh, or the topmost activities in one's life that is something which is known as against bhakti or uh, uh, not uttama bhakti it is not first class devotional service hmm? a devotee might do some satyagraha for example just to just to please somebody Uh, he might do that that kind of satyagraha maybe somebody is friend of a devotee who is a very nationalist and he says he request devotee that you also come with me to do this satyagraha uh, for for congress party or maybe for bharatiya janata party or maybe for independence of the country or for fighting the government or the local authorities in the in the in the region so devotee might go there but devotee will understand that i am doing this vrata satyagraha only to uh, only to please my friend and this is not the absolute uh, activity as far as my devotion is concerned absolute activity or my devotion is concerned the prime activity is anukolena krishna anushilanam favorable activity devoid of any hostility for doing krish for pleasing krishna for making krishna happy that is mean that means there are activities of bhakti we will discuss in our future classes so that is under the purview of bhakti but activities like satyagraha or fasting for uh, bhuk hartal or desh bhakti desh bhakti and and maybe karva chauth and all these kind of things are not uh, not really uh, uh, uttama bhakti okay thank you prabhu ji thank you yeah good question <clears throat> 
so i hope uh, it was useful to understand technically what bhakti is and uh, to go to dive deep into this uh, book uh, bhakti rasamrit sindhu and nectar of devotion by shila prabhupar i hope it will help you uh, to develop more and more taste for scriptures for reading scriptures uh, and we will continue our discussion in the in the future class next sunday till then uh, thank you very much hari krishna hari <clears throat> krishna hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna prabhu hari krishna thank you hari krishna prabhu hari krishna rakesh thank you prabhu ji nectar of devotion aur bhakti rasamrit sindhu alag alag kitab hai english mein hi ha prabhu ji ye bhakti rasam dekhe dono kitabe hain ये नेक्टर ऑफ डिवोशन है और ये भक्ति रसामृत सिंधु का ट्रांसलेशन है भानु महाराज द्वारा जो कमेंट्री जीव गोस्वामी ने और श्री विश्वनाथ चक्रवर्ती ठाकुर ने रूप गोस्वामी के बुक के ऊपर लिखी है तो आप रूप गोस्वामी के वर्सिस से अपने आप नहीं समझ सकते अगर मैं आपको सिर्फ ये श्लोक दे दू तो आप अपने आप नहीं समझ सकते तो उनको समझने के लिए आपको कमेंट्रीज का सहारा लेना पड़ेगा तो कमेंट्रीज किसने लिखी है कमेंट्रीज लिखी है जीव गोस्वामी ने और विश्वनाथ चक्रवर्ती ठाकुर ने ये आचार्य हैं ये टॉप मोस्ट वैष्णव हैं लेकिन ये कमेंट्री उन्होंने लिखी है संस्कृत में जी इनको यदि हमें समझना है तो हमें इनका ट्रांसलेशन लेना होगा वो ट्रांसलेशन किया है भानु महाराज ने जब प्रभु जी मेरे पे ऐसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी वाला ट्रांसलेशन नहीं आपके पास नेटर ऑफ डिवोशन होगा आपके पास ये होगा ये होगा आपके पास हाँ आपके पास ये होगा जी हाँ ये ये ऑफ डिवोशन है प्रभुपाद जी ने जो इंग्लिश में लिखी उसका हिंदी अनुवाद आपने लिया है जी है? ये जो है ये ओरिजिनल वर्क है उसके कमेंट्री के साथ कमेंट्री लिखी है जीव गोस्वामी ने और विश्वनाथ चक्रवर्ती ठाकुर ने तो ये वाली ले ली है इसका आप कवर पेज का फोटो भेज दीजिएगा मैं इसको मैं, मैं आपको भेज दूंगा मैं आपको भेज दूंगा मैं आपको एड्रेस भी भेज दूंगा जहाँ से आप ये ले सकते हैं जी जी और जब आप इसके वर्सिस को कॉमेंट्रीज को हमारे लेक्चर के साथ मिलाकर जब आप पढ़ेंगे समझेंगे तो आपको डिटेल में सब चीज समझ में आ जाएगी जी प्रभु थैंक यू प्रभु ओके थैंक यू जी